doesn't need an introduction. They will be sitting as regularly. So, how well? Thank you. Oh, I think we have uh, a yeah. Can you hear me and laugh from back there? Yeah? Yes. In which case, I prefer to do that. No, I mean, if you can hear me, it's, I don't feel like I need Or maybe you can move yeah. a little bit forward. And actually just shout along the path if you lose it somewhere. So, thanks a lot for the warm welcome. And um, I, I must say that I incredibly enjoy my being here every time. It's actually become one of the purposes for my other teaching to set up time to come here and spend like a few weeks with all of you. So thanks a lot for the welcome and the, the warm welcoming that I've been receiving throughout these years. I, I use this term landscape, borrowing it from Elizabeth Edwards. Some of you may have read her work. She's a fellow anthropologist who been working like on, on, on photography uh, throughout. And I like this idea of a landscape in order also to move away from a more deterministic notion of technology, or the more specific one of practice, which is the one that I otherwise use. So I like to keep it fairly, um, fairly diffused by using this term. Um, of course, I'm entering a field that has been uh, widely uh, debated. And I do so also, which I need to kind of briefly inform you about from also uh, a twofold entry point. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, I'm schooled as a social anthropologist, turned um, visual anthropologist, uh, but I'm also a filmmaker and a photographer before that. So I've been kind of joined in these two paths. Presently, I, I teach film studies and visual culture, that's, that's my position. Um, so I entered this terrain of images in a digital landscape from a practice based entry, working like with, with uh, documentary film, interactive practices, documentary film in, in uh, theatre settings, in, uh, in exhibition settings, <clears throat> but of course also from a theoretical entry. So and, um, I think you know, you're going to quickly realise that what I'm talking about has this double, uh, double point of view throughout. Um, and what I also need to inform you about, which is not what I will be talking about here today is that my present research is really looking at image making practices in contemporary India, taking off from Delhi. I'm looking like at practices that somehow are connected to an idea of the document or of documenting. So, I'm not talking documentary film as a, as a genre per se, but I'm kind of entering this field of documenting and intervening upon social issues through images. Um, but once again, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I've been doing research on this now for a few years, but I haven't really gotten there yet, so I'm, I'm not really prepared to talk about that. So I really want to look at what my kind of constant recent publishing and teaching has been about, which is actually extrapolating a number of broader reflections of theoretical nature by looking at the number of conventional uh, digital practices in the field of, of, of image making. Um, and I, uh, oh, this is funny, I have three. There's like a third one there which shows in here, but it doesn't show up there. This is like the one on this screen. So, this is the one I have to add. This does not. Stay. Okay, now we'll pop up. Uh, basically, there's three separate chapters that I would like to elaborate upon. Um, the first one is about really what Le Manovich labeled as media convergence, tackled from another entry point. I'm really talking at the distinction between different types <coughs> of media, which happens in a, in a digital context. Basically, the point I'm trying to put through here is that in the context of interactive practices, for instance, I would look at dialogues, interactive documentaries, that's probably the most uh, evident case for this form of convergence. You have like an interesting fusion there of what was still images, moving images, uh, sound, and even text and animation. You know? So one question that I would raise to that is <clears throat> how we should deal with 
conventional assumptions regarding the nature of images in these contexts, in contexts such as the one of, of interactive documentaries. A second point that I will raise is that digital practices today seem quite clearly to be pointing out in the direction of an enhanced interest for questions of materiality, for bodily questions, for interaction body to body, body to matter. So with my second example, which is gathered from another very popular image making practice, which is the use of uh, action cameras in context of filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, I'll show you a clip from one of uh, uh, from Lucent Taylor's most recent film, Leviathan, those of you who have not seen I mean we're entering the field of Napic cinema in a way. Um, but tackling it once again from, from its most popular range. I mean, these, these are technologies that both interactive documentary and action cameras and stuff that we are increasingly using, that are becoming increasingly popular and they merge with other practices. Um, so they're not going to make a point really about materiality and how you know, image making in a digital landscape is actually pointing. The first point is about blurring the distinction between images and other type of media. The second one is really about images as, as objects, as material objects, a request of thinking in terms of corporality and, and, and bodies. And the third point, which is quite a classic one, is about reflecting on the meaning of reality in these contexts. And, and in particular of the anchorage of images in pro-filmic reality. Yeah. And for doing that, I'll be talking about another very popular technology, HDR photography. Uh, Instagram, one of the, the special effects that you put on Instagram is an HDR effect. This is something that started off as a cheap technology that we had in our mobile phones and it went up all the way to win the World Press Photo um, Prize, the, the award. Paul Hansen, one, I'm, I'm going to show you that photograph later on in 2013, with a photograph which was taken and produced with the help of HDR. It was contested saying that, okay, this has nothing to do with reality. So I'm just using that technology as a way of entering that debate and then be thinking a bit about it. But let us just give a bit of, um, of a framework for that. So the arrival of digital imaging around 1990, I must say that I'm generally used to actually read through my papers, but I've kind of prepared a number of different entries. So if we do it in a dialogical format, I'm quite happy to be interrupted, hence I will not read, I'd rather talk in my paper. Um, so in the 1990s, the introduction of, of, of digital imaging uh, created this buzz, this calls for like possible revolution that was about to happen. Um, just to take two important quotes, Jonathan Crary and WJT Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell spoke about the birth of a new model of vision altogether. So vision does not only mean what we call it meant, the digital imposing a new logic. And Jonathan Crary said that uh, the arrival of digital imaging entailed the transformation in the nature of visuality, probably more profound than the break that separates medieval imagery from Renaissance perspective. Which, of course, we could deconstruct also this kind of statement whether you know Renaissance perspective actually created that revolution or not. But I mean, that opens up quite an interesting space uh, for debating it in terms of, of, of the history of art. But surely we can notice. Uh, something which has happened. We are way into the digital era, we're probably already in a post-digital era, and actually my arguments here speak about an overcoming of the idea of the digital, at least the way we've been thinking about it. We're engaging more, more with bodies and contexts again today than ever before, thanks to technologies that supposedly were sublimating that kind of connection. Uh, and surely, you know, we've been discussing uh, the, the possibility of ubiquity, uh, and it's quite a matter of fact that images have become more than ever ubiquitous today thanks to these technologies and in particular thanks to a twofold development. One is the entanglement of imaging with, with the web, yeah? the web 2.0 in particular. You know, this, I love this sentence, the it, it, implicit architecture of participation of the web 2.0, this way in which it immerses the viewer, asks from the viewer a direct participation, a possibility to interact physically with it with images and with cheap image producing devices. Incorporation of the cameras into the mobile phones is like a kind of 
when, when Apple came up with that idea, uh, it was criticized as being something totally unreasonable. Oh, it's cameras work right with the one camera, the phone with the camera inside. Yeah? And now if you look at Flickr today, you must have noticed that on Flickr, globally, the iPhone 4S and the iPhone 5 are the most used cameras. My photographers are working on Flickr. <coughs> you have journalists working on iPhones, you have uh, prices for iPhone photographers. It's become like kind of a new trend. So these two phenomena, which are of course that I think they're connected, mobile phone cameras actually use the, the web in order to actually uh, create a new, a new way of, of producing, distributing, interacting with images, have created a boost. Yeah, and, and there is a ubiquity in, in that. And the number of fields I just mentioned a few there are, are quite incredible. I mean, from from sharing sites to Instagram to Flickr, geo media, geolocated media, to control cameras, interactive films, small televisions, video games, virtual environments, to more and more common in the uh, museum and exhibition context, Google Glasses, I mean augmented reality in all its forms, and the spread of cheap cameras have all become, and I, I'm using here a local diesel uh, sentence, you know, ways of being in the world. I mean, we relate to the world on a daily basis through these technologies. We, we filter our world through these technologies, which is actually leading to quite a lot of requires from us, a lot of rethinking also in terms of, of preconceived uh, uh, dichotomies between reality and representation. Now, this is an ongoing exchange. Google Glasses kind of discussed in greater detail instead actually do that, they, they, they bring in a virtual vision if you go direct, supposedly vision, making that distinction like a bed. Uh, the figures are incredible, and these are quite old figures probably. I, I, I keep updating them whenever I can, but I always miss the train in a way, because every time I look at them, they, they have almost nearly doubled. 6.7 billion people view the world through their own lens. I use that sentence to say that this is, you know, taking pictures, looking at pictures, you know, that all activity, 6.7 billion of people every day. Uh, 5 million pictures are uploaded on Flickr on a daily basis. Uh, 2 billion videos are on a daily basis streamed on YouTube, 2 billion. Uh, Facebook, Facebook is to me the most interesting case because Facebook was formed actually as a text-based mean of communication and now it's become the biggest database of photography in the world. So there's been a shift. I mean, Facebook was not contemplating images from the beginning, but had to adapt to it. The purchase of Instagram being probably the, the, the coronation of that process. And look, at this is a fantastic figure that I've taken from, a, from a, an anthropologist, a medical anthropologist, uh, Michael Wish, that YouTube in six months has been able to produce what the first few major, major national channels in the US have been able to do in 60 years of history. So we're talking about a phenomenon that is almost understandable. I mean, the, the sheer size of it is, is, is uh, almost ungraspable uh, for us. Um, but that is also the, the problem with it, the way I see it at least, that the figures are, are impressive to the extent that they make us blind to the nature of the change that we're facing. Yeah? So there's a lot of talk at the level really of this incredible spread and distribution of, of these uh, practices, but to what extent are they actually marking out the birth of a new model of vision? What is the qualitative change which is actually happening? And what is the kind of cultural change that is taking place with regards to a way of, of dealing with images? How can we start like, kind of identifying these, these bits and pieces? And the title of my paper hints at, it's again my way of approaching this, is that there is a, a movement beyond vision, beyond the frame. I mean, what, what these practices are enacting in us is a rethinking of images beyond the context of visual culture or visual studies, you know, if you were to take They require from us the capacity to learn the functioning of hyper taste, to be more aware of, of social political context, to be more aware of, of questions of materiality. Phenomenology comes in as an incredible tool for understanding these practices. And then, so this is kind of the argument that I, I will uh, that I will expand upon uh, today. <clears throat> Before doing that, however, I just want to stress, make clear that this distinction that I made between technologies and practices, and I try to avoid speaking of technologies uh, for 
<coughs> reasons that are of course obvious to all of us. Um, the iPhone was born with its back camera, no front of the camera. No one thought that you could put Skype in there. Yeah? Then suddenly we realized that Skype could actually be used on these devices. Skype was designed for it. So we started turning the phone and talking into Skype from the back. Yeah? Hence the next model of iPhone built the front of the camera so we could avoid the camera. So this is a classic uh, dialectic, you know, with the technology of the user. You know, so does the chicken come before the egg? No, um, I think I avoid talking about technology in order to avoid deterministic arguments, you know, that the iPhone dictates our behavior. But it does, surely it does. But it doesn't, we also create changes into the, into the phone through our users, you know, accumulating practice needs also for users to adapt the technology. So that's the first disclaimer that this whole field of debate to me has been very polarized uh, between uh, you know praises of the arrival of the cyber democracy through these tools or the death of real life, real photography, you know, this is the end of something. And both these arguments are quite deterministic, they generally rely upon a very deterministic approach to technology. So my way of expressing practice is a way to try at least uh, linguistically to overcome that, that kind of expectation. Um, and the second aspect, which I will have no time whatsoever, is that this is like a very kind of universalistic view, but of course, specific contexts do impose their own uh, necessities upon these developments. So, infrastructure, uh, social class, ethnicity, gender are all like. When we start looking, that's why I've, I've moved my research back to them, you know, to actually contextualize it. I think, you know, a lot of writers of digital technologies fly over the earth in a way, you know, and we need to kind of bring feedback. On earth. Some of the interactive documentaries I'm showing to you do not work in Panchi Lake Lake because the connection speed there is actually too slow. So you look at other interactive documentaries. I mean, the very banal infrastructural needs are part of our, of our understanding. So these were the two kind of disclaimers that I, I wanted to introduce you to. So let me come up with the, with the first example, <coughs> uh, the first question regarding really the meaning of, of media. And I want to tackle that, as I pre-announced, through the, uh, the field of interactive documentaries. Um, I know some of you know interactive documentaries, we've been discussing them throughout these days. Uh, some other people may not be so interested, but this is like a kind of a growing practice that still has not found its own market, therefore it's considered by many filmmakers as a kind of an avant-garde terrain. Um, and basically, you know, it's a merger of, of documentary film practices with, uh, with, the, web, with the web 2.0. Yeah? So we're fundamentally talking about documentary practice which uses interactivity. As a, as, as a kind of a central tool in its delivery mechanism. Um, I could speak about that for quite long, but the best way to actually uh, give a sense of it is by showing just one example. Um, so this, this is a, a, a popular documentary called I Rise, produced by, by the National Film Board of Canada, which together with up there is one of the two big producers. They have money to waste, basically, so they decide to put it in avant-garde filmmaking. There's no clue, they have no clue about what the income could be from it, you know, there's no market for it, but not in this. Uh, Interactive Documentary Saturday, a number of festivals. It fun, up to down, for instance, there's a whole section just on that. There's an iDocs conference, some festival happening every year in Bristol, so this is really expanding. A lot of newspapers have adopted these languages. They incorporate, if you look at the garden, it incorporates special reportages in this shape, you know. Um, so let me just, just show you a bit how, how this looked like. Next slide, if my bit is activated, which I uh, This is like an entry page. Um, and I want to go into, of course, it's divided into different blocks and pieces. There's no coherence here. You cannot go back the same route that you got into the first time. You know, there's no beginning, there's no end. It's like a living archive where you are asked to actually intervene and construct the narrative by moving from one end to another. Um, Alright, doesn't seem to be drilling. 
just to give you a, a dynamic um, of what we're talking about. Okay, this is going to be way too long. So, Luckily, I had prepared Plan B. Uh, plan B is I have taken like screenshots from one documentary um, called Prison Valley. I just want to give you a very quick uh, insight into what it is. You open the home page of Prison Valley, yeah, and you are asked to <coughs> connect it to it. So it immediately it defines you as a user. Once again, the way that the people behind this are proper documentary filmmakers joined up with web designers, of course, that's the kind of the crucial uh, keyword. And uh, so you will connect with your Facebook or whatever you have. <coughs> and at that point, you're going to be introduced to a video. It's a one and a half minute clip, which is introducing you to the history of this particular place. It's a valley in the US where there are 37,000 inhabitants and 10,000 inmates. One third of the population is inmates. There's seven jails. So all the economy of this, this city is connected to the So they decided to make a documentary on what it means to live in a place like this. And all we have connections, social connections, economic connections that are. You watch your video clip. When that is over, you're entering a room. Yeah? You've got an, actually at the end of the video clip, you walk into a reception, a hotel reception. That's where the clip ends. So that's where you're going to click and say, yes, I want to enter. And you enter into this room. Now, in this room, what you do with your mouse is that by clicking on one corner, you move around the room. It's a 360 technology. Yeah? It's a reconstruction. It's still photographs, reconstructing a dynamic environment. You move around there, and you discover a number of items that have small labels, or that will animate once you kind of move your cursor on top of them. Yeah? So you just decide to select one of them. You know, Imagine that I would select notebook. And then I go there. I have a notebook. It's very gimmick. Yeah? By the way, I don't like high docs, that's another disclaimer I have to make. It says that aesthetically I find it quite boring. But intellectually, in terms of the rethinking they force us to do, or what we do when we construct a narrative in a documentary film, they are of course giving back you know, a lot of what we've been dreaming of being able to do, incorporate the viewers' own wish parts and desires and the disciplines and so on and so forth. So anyway, we have here Anina Dabrowska, she's uh, the owner of the small hotel where families, relatives to the inmates go and visit. You click on the different pages of the diary, you can read stuff. You can click on the photographs and you will explore that material, so on and so forth. Um, down here at the bottom, which you will not see behind my back, you have of course a number of different options. You can just send off this to your networks, you know, send the link to your Facebook. You can also go Send in a comment immediately. There's a chat with you. So all the people who are viewing this documentary at the same time as you can communicate with each other. Yeah? So you can share the news directly. But you can also then chat with the characters in the film. Yeah? So that you can send them a message. So you can have a direct interaction. Another way, thing that you can do is that if we had gone out from the room again to the, 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 the small door at the side, you would enter a map. Yeah. So the same material, the same database that I could have looked at by following that structure of the notebook and the characters, yeah. I can search through to this map. Yeah. This map allows me to select also characters to the left. I can identify them in the map. So I can do a bit of both characters or place. And I find interesting places. For instance, there's a <coughs> cinema hall that I can decide to go into. You can explore the cinema hall. There's trailers of the film they are showing. There's trailers of film that were done. This prison valley, this valley was actually a valley where they used to do a lot of Western films back in times. So they've incorporated that material and so on and so forth. So I think this is enough for you to kind of see, see a bit of the dynamics. There's a plethora of things to say about this. Yeah? Uh, I don't want to focus on whatever you're seeing up here at the moment. But of course, one thing we notice is that image work 
merges with hyperplanes. The function is always clicking on something, say to somewhere else. That's the, the, the hyperplanes. It's a form of consequential writing to use that. It makes us problematize the idea of the viewers. The viewers are constructing, they are giving time based autonomy to the narrative. They are constructing the, the, the narrative as they go on. And they are exercising their own agency. Uh, we could easily notice how this is an example of what we all call relational aesthetics. It's about art practices moving away from the attention to the object of art into the relation between the object of art and the user. Yeah? So this is all about relationality. If I don't do anything when I watch an iDoc, the iDoc doesn't happen. And if I go back into an iDoc two days later, I will not be able to do the same thing. So it's really creating something which is relational and textual. Yeah? Final point that we could make is also the fact that this builds upon an idea of also bringing people together. Users can communicate with each other, they can share experiences and so on and so forth. But what I'm really interested at is that, which is what I would have preferred to show you in its and its model. <coughs> No, the loading is still at zero percent. What you would have seen in, in, in the material I've shown you so far is that within the lapse of a few passages, we have a video clip, we have textual material, we have sounds, we have photographs, we have environments, we have dynamic environments constructed in animation with the help of photographs, yeah? So anyway, if we think of it in terms of media convergence, this iDocs just function as one example of the way in which Before the film actually begins. 
Yeah, so he says, when you walk into the cinema, the moment the lights go off, an expectation happens which brings you to the mood of watching a film. So you are starting that process of watching a film, even in the absence of anything, it's dark. Sound begins, yeah? In documentary film, in schools, you know, that's the first thing you learn. Always anticipate the image with the sound. Sound problem always in before the image. The moment the sound begins, says Rancière, we have an image already popping up. We are constructing in our mind an image, which then will be contrasted or confirmed by the actual visual image coming up. So I started working on that, you know, correspondence in terms of digital practices. And once again, Alcide does not write about digital culture whatsoever. But he writes that the whole, in some synthesis, that we are in the realm of, of the post-image. Let me see if I find it. Yeah, he says, um, yeah, that the end of images is behind us. That was the sentence I was talking about. He said it's already behind us, you know? And he said, in a way, that, that's the whole point that I will make at the end of this presentation, is that whatever we're talking about now in terms of digital practices, if you look back into art history and various contributions to, to our understanding of photography and film, they are already all described. Yeah? So this is a bit of what Rancière is doing, he says that the end is already behind us. And what images actually are about, he says, we should not talk about images, but the quality of images, which is imageness. And he says that imageness, to, see, to him, is a regime of relations between elements and between functions. Relations between the stable and the physical. Way of playing with the before and after, cause and effect. These are operations that couple and uncouple the physical and its significance. Um, I find this a fantastic way of rethinking, you know, what we mean by images, especially in a digital context. And it's really introducing this idea of coupling and decoupling, you know, of interrupting uh, connections and of making them happen. And also of, of bringing to the same length level, the sayable and the visible, the visible with other kind of significations. Yeah. And if we enlarge the vision from interactive documentaries, this is something that has been done for quite some time in the context of, of uh, art. This is uh, Studio Zurro, um, Milan-based arts group you might think all of you will have come across. They, they were quite um, ahead of time in Europe. They started doing like interactive installations, sensorial environments already in the early 90s, so they were kind of pushing on these points quite early on. And this is uh, one of their exhibitions called The Garden of Things. Garden of Things is a space of this sort when you enter with a number of monitors and there are also objects in the same room. Uh, and the monitors are projecting uh, infrared images, images filmed in infrared technology. So you are visualizing matter, very simply, because uh, infrared technology depicts heat yeah? rather than, than visible stimuli, but it translates them into something visualizable. So basically you see nothing, then the hands pop up in the image, they are warm so you can identify them. As they start moving around an object, yeah, the object starts taking shape. Yeah? They call this electronic magma, that's a way of, of, of creating this concept. Yeah? So once again the hands move and when the hands relieve the object, remove the pressure from the object, the object starts taking different shapes. Okay? So then the point that they were making is quite interesting, that you heat these objects are different kind of items, you know? They, they show an entire different identity. They show a different, a different look altogether. Um, another example from, um, from the world of pop, House of Cards, Radiohead. This is a clip from 2005. Um, they called it the first invisible video clip. I think they used that term. This is all made in laser. Yeah, this is all laser technology. So once again here we have a magnetic interaction. Yeah, bringing it back to the idea of imageness. How can we interpret these kind of experiments if we stick to the idea of the visible? Yeah, here it's something that we visualize from information which is not the visual nature. Yeah? So this is like a 3D scan. It's a combination of two different scans. You have one which is the uh, 
I repeat this kind of around the central subject, and then you have further on in the same video, you can see if I find this spot. Yeah. Um, a scan which kind of it takes like external areas out. So it's not moving around with either around the subject, but it's locating it out. So this is the neighborhood of it, where they film, where they shot the video. Um, so this is another example once again of how these technologies have crept into different domains. Documentary, art, pop culture, uh, photography. This is David Zolder. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with this photographer. Failed Memories is one of his exhibitions. What he's done is that he's photographed home subjects or grid system photographs and actually hacked the processor for use in them. What you think when you see this image is that this is a skilled Photoshop intervention, but it's actually not Photoshop. This is the originally produced image. So it's actually acting at the level of the sensor, at the processor of the camera. So it's hacking the processor. So that is producing these kind of distorted glitch charts, or it's often grinding with the negative glitch charts. What I find interesting once again here is that the procedure for making these images goes beyond vision and goes straight into digital culture. This is an algorithm that has been hacked. So we have a number of these examples that I connect to interactive documentary for stressing the need to actually rethink, this is the first of the three points that I want to share with you, to rethink what we mean by image at all. You know? So these practices to me kind of make evident that uh, there's nothing given in, in the idea of it, in the concept of image when we, when we discuss about it anymore, when we have kind of step take a step back and rethink more carefully our, our uh, identification here. Are you following me so far? Yes. Yeah. Um, second, uh, second uh, uh, thought. Yeah. By the way, I mean, on our talks I've been writing quite a lot. I've been writing quite a lot on, on uh, metadata, so the cooperation of metadata and photography. This stuff here, I keep discussing presenting, I have been lazy, so I'm, I'm, I kind of use this opportunity to put this together in the round. So I'm really interested in the feedback. Um, now, to discuss the question of materiality and the movement into action cameras, which is my core example, I, I, I need you to take a step away from images for a while and just very blunt into, into the realm of, of digital culture. Um, if we go to a coffee shop and we speak about digital culture, probably the leading, uh, say, uh, um, interpretive space is still today set by the concept of digitization, virtual virtuality, virtualization. So this is what actually this is how we, we came across the digital as a, as a way to make material items virtual. You know, a book becomes a PDF, a song becomes an art. I mean, a record becomes an empty tree. A photograph becomes a JPEG. It's not in my drawer anymore. It's out there in, on Facebook. Is it mine? Whose is it? And so on and so forth. Yeah? That's the, the, the conceptual framework in which, in which we have movies. Now, in recent five, six years, though, there has been a passage which Apple sanctified yesterday, they before the launch of the new iPhone 6. I go back to that. Actually, mostly with a watch which is a passage uh, from bits to atom. This is a slogan that was used by Wired, the magazine. But it's, I mean, they use it for a different purpose, but it's quite a significant passage. Now, one of the most booming trends, uh, just the other day in London, the uh, 3D photo show, another 3D art show was, uh, was inaugurated. Yeah, an art show just made on 3D printing. So one of the leading booming technologies in digital uh, in digital technologies recently has been the uh, the 3D printer. This 3D printer in particular belongs to a friend of mine who does props for cinema. He's been doing the Hamlets for Troy. You know, he was working with with kind of with the medieval stuff. So he used to go and do medieval prints. Now he's doing all this stuff with with this technology. Yeah, very simply with the. Um, with the 3D processes. But what the 3D does, the 3D printer does, is that it does exactly the opposite than what digitization is do. It takes an abstract idea, converts it into an image, which you see projected here in a CAD. There's even simpler programs for doing that. 
which will then send out information to the breaker, which will simply connect those threads of plastic, melt them, and construct an object. Yeah? So it's exactly the opposite plastic, not from the object to the virtual image or idea, the abstraction, but from the abstraction to the, to the object. Now, this has created a quite uh, frightening market. In a way, frightening this is because I think I'm starting to grow old and so it's pretty scary. Um, but like uh, bio have been created. This plastic thread that gets melted and produces the object is called, a, a, it's called an ink. You buy it as an ink. Uh, but they've produced bio ink. So this is living cells producing the ink. So a lot of experimentation on the Momo is, is the leading company in that market. Is producing, is using this technology to, to, they've been doing already muscle patches with certain living bodies. They've been trying out to create patches for hearts, you know. They've been doing like microorganisms for animals to be tested and so on and so forth. You see the point that I'm making is very straightforward. I mean, we think of the digital as, as something volatile and virtual and actually developments in digital technology are actually going exactly the opposite way. They are rooting us down to it. Yeah? This guy knows something about the Japanese employee who loved experimenting with the, the construction of guns in 3D printers, and he ended up in jail. So real are they? I mean, to the extent that you ended up in jail for using them. Um, another um, field that the Economist had a report in, uh, in uh, January 2014 from the, uh, from the Name. There's a fair in the U.S. in Texas somewhere. Well, it's a fair on on, on uh, domestic digital technologies or something like that. So anyway, the the, the, the main title that the, the economist gave to it was about the boom of smart clothes or e clothes. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of experimentation that has been going on for years in the military in particular. Now, the uniforms that soldiers wear in many parts of the world are wired so that in the first place they transport energy. So they got like batteries here by the pump and you got something else here. So, you know, the body becomes just like kind of a, a, a tool for conveying, you know, information and energy from one side of the body to another. But it contains also coarse information. So now, as you see there, you know, like you have uh, pads or, or um, what do you call them? Well, you're right. The name, is, the name escapes me. Uh, writing keyboards. A keyboard. Sorry. Yeah. So keyboards are embedded in your. So you basically interact with those. Now, in in the. Um, in the world of commercial devices, Adidas has now launched smart clothes for sports. Concept being very simple, you have sensors on your body, yeah, getting information about your performance. That, that information goes straight out to your coach, who on his or her computer will be able to process that information. Second step of development here is that these same materials now have also what they call activators. Some of these key clothes carry on activators, which means that me as a coach, I'm getting information of your performance, I'm seeing that your abs are working too little and that's probably slowing you down as you run, so I'm stimulating your abs directly. So the activators actually gather information from the, from the laptop of the coach, send it back. It's like, a, I mean, we're going back to the idea of the wrong you know? So basically, you know, a virtually driven human body. And this is actually being tested in the world of sports. It's all entirely real. It's not the side or uh, futuristic model anymore. Sorry, this one I always have to show. This is, uh, of course, a Japanese, Rajpu. It's a Japanese company who's created sensors that should detect love. This is how they market it. So only the presence of love, calculated through adrenaline, uh, heartbeat, so on so and so forth, with a drama leash. Yeah? So this, of course, has, but this gives you an idea of the span of possibilities in the sense that if they're making gimmicks like this, it means that it's a technology which is widely available. And look at what happened in the other day. So this is material that I've been collecting in the past year and a half. It's very recent, but not avant-garde. Yeah? It's out there, it's everywhere. I mean, GPS watches for runners are there, you know, which calculate by pressure your, your uh, heart rate and so on and so forth. But look what Apple, I mean, the, 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 the catch in Apple's recent campaign has been on health. 
I don't know if you followed that, but I found it quite interesting. The new software and the watch are actually meant to synchronize with your body. This is what they want, yeah? So basically, on the, on the seat behind every watch, there and then here, so you close the watch, there's a sensor, yeah? So it detects your, um, your heart rate. Uh, you can do also calculation on adrenaline, I don't remember the, the, the technology behind that. So basically, they translate that into moods. This is the idea. So they can understand your emotions. Are you scared of that? Now, following development, which Spotify is looking at, is that if you're connecting your, your iPhone to it, and you have your headset plugged in, uh, you can ask your computer to calm you down. Yeah? So if you detect stress, you would tell him, OK, uh, I recorded my mom's voice. Please send that to me. So you're sitting on the tube. There is someone killing someone, and your mom is talking to you. So that, that's a kind of mod. So you see that it's beyond the beat because what we were used to is that we can capture information from the body through the senses. But now these actuators are doing something more. We can intervene upon the body. So the body is literally becoming acted upon through the technology. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this device could also be used as surveillance, right? Yeah, well, that's, that's, the, that's the trick. Yeah. There's a whole space of ethics and, and legal implications and surveillance which are literally frightening. Yeah. Also because that one comes along with all your personal data. So also you're, you're functioning during different hours of the day. So your marketing possibilities are, okay, this guy is actually intellectually awake, you know, between five and six in the afternoon. So that's when you want to take him out. So that's when you want to start getting. So of course there is a... But if we now look more closely into what these kind of shifts have meant in terms of visual technologies, which is where I want to take you, is that this genetic process of, of synchronizing with the body is actually taking place in that field as well. Uh, Google, um, Google Glasses, failure on the market, no, they don't work. But they, their, their pretense was exactly this one, you know, of being able to uh, merge virtual information and, and non-virtual information. How, how are we going to call it now? This becomes also real stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and basically, so when you wear these glasses, you're going to have stuff being projected on your glass. Uh, users speak of it as being incredibly confusing and, and annoying and disturbing. Yeah. But of course, the headset was, was as well at the beginning. And the internet thought of everyone thought it was going to kill the radio. The radio is cool, it's as it's all we it always takes time before this technology actually creeping to our data. But this is nothing but you know, a good example of augmented reality. You know? Metadata coming into your everyday life conception. This is one of my one of most beloved items. I still don't have one, but I want to buy one. It's a small um, life logging camera. This is the generic term. This one is called the Narrative, built by a Swedish company called Memoto. It's a small device that you carry, it's entirely waterproof, temperature resistant, whatever. So you wear it on you for the whole day, and it takes a photo every 30 seconds or one minute. You can set it, of course, with different kind of It's like a time lapse, yeah? but it's a moving time lapse. So basically, it keeps a living diary of whatever you've been doing today. How do they market this? They market this to our capacity to remember it. So I mean, this I find quite fascinating. Their kid launches it as you had a wonderful meal in some place and you don't remember where that was. You just go back at night. When you connect that machine to your computer, you get like a different sets of visualizations. One is a video clip, one is a map. Two different ways of looking. Now what I find interesting about this is that in, in the space of social science, with ethical implications that are also there quite tricky, it can be really used to record information. I mean, you like, can identify and locate bits of people who work like a lot of spaces for instance. You can actually have quite a lot of insight from it. But the point I want to make here is once again that we have here a digital technology, technology for producing images that sticks to your body, that kind of takes that point of view, you know, and interacts with your everyday life. You know, it comes closer to you in your everyday life. Of course, this opens a, a wide space of, of, of reflections on the fact that images today actually already have. We don't need the memoto to or the narrative life on the camera to say these things because look at how we consume images today. Uh, I just took some images from Facebook. Facebook is what now? It's, uh, it's a timeline 
Yeah, so the information is, is right in terms of it's an ephemeral kind of construction, but it's an arrow, it's a time based arrow, then it will disappear. Retired information, this is my friend Yelena with her beloved dog. Yeah, so these photos contain today relational material in the way that we consume it. You know? We're not, not, not only just seeing the image, but we have a lot of extra information concerning who was there, when was it taken. The, um, yeah, here we have like just one of the visualizations from your, uh, uh, what's it called? The uh, iPhoto. Yeah? <coughs> iPhoto, you can view way with pictures on the map. So, this has become like Flickr also does that, not Flickr creates that. So, we are already incorporating photographs today in our everyday life through metadata. Anyway, so these technologies are just making this a bit more explicit. But what I'm interested at is that. All these technologies, what they actually identify is the same passage that the digital technologies in general are doing. From the virtual to the body, yeah? To everyday life. Now, my favorite example for discussing that is this. Uh, this is an action camera, the GoPro. Because this really shows what this camera is about. When I bought my GoPro, the first thing I, I did was to throw it in a pond. You want to kind of throw it in the water, you want to put it in the sand. I mean, it's really built for being worn. You put it on you and you kind of put it in nature. You know, you, you, you mount it on, on bands, on, on arms or support. You can immerse it in the water, in the sand. You can do a lot of that stuff. Now, I wanted to give you some examples of how this is done. One of them that some of you have seen with me these days already. Uh, and it's just because this camera was designed for action sports, yeah? surfers, yeah. American Californian surfers, they designed it. And the fantastic thing about this camera is not the capacity to capture images, a lot of cameras do, but it's a, it invented a stabilizer. So the image is stable compared to other cameras, yeah, much more stable. So I mean, that's really what, what made it its success. So look at uh, things like this. Cinema in my own 
way of looking at one and just really bringing us to experience something that we can not experience in the other sense of our head and this kind of technology. Now the question is, I mean, that the McDougal, when I asked him, the, the, the filmmaker, the documentary filmmaker, when I asked him about this film, he said, oh, there's something cosmological about this, something really cosmic, he said, and it's quite a, a fantastic experience. Uh, what is interesting about this is that the GoPro is a camera that costs, the cheapest model is like 230 euros, the most expensive one is 450. I mean, before the GoPro doing something like this, we would probably be talking about at the zero, at the now two zeros up. So, my point is that, I mean, this is fabulous material, uh, but what is interesting with this material is that this is like just what I did playing with this camera. I mean, it really allows you to suddenly start filming things that you were not able to film before. And do so in a quite immediate way. What is fascinating is I started interviewing people who use the GoPro and they all say, ah, it's like filming in the old days because you don't see what you're doing. Yeah, there's no viewfinder. You just throw it out there, then at night you come home, you collect it like you said, okay, what should I do with it? So the angle, straightening up the angle is like an ongoing process of trial and error. To do this stupid bit, it took me anyway three days. First time it didn't go well at all. But like what I started using it for, for instance, is for uh, this is not a project that I've been dealing with. It's really about embodiment in, in the, and visualizations in, in the context of tennis. I started like building it on top of players, using the camera on players, and it does two things. Here we're doing exercises on breath, you know, the coordination of breathing with the movement of tennis. So this camera allows you to actually capture a lot of this information, which otherwise, once again, was not impossible, but would require high budget, professional budget. So this, this is the point that I'm making. These kind of technologies are popularizing haptic cinema for the masses. They're making it available. Now I'm generalizing in the masses, but still, my nephew has a GoPro, the cheapest one, you know, he's been saving money for like CCS, you know, he'll be streaming up doing something and then So this is actually making this kind of material available. Look at these. These are photographs, you see, these are not made with the GoPro. Snail. What, what's this? You identify it. Lichen. It's a lichen. You know lichen? Yes. It's plants that grow in, in uh, harsh climates. Look at this. Well, these are photographs that I've taken with, uh, with the iPhone. With my regular iPhone. Building on it, I just thought and I, I, I saw it here at Chroma also, they had them sometimes back. You know, just lenses, macro lenses for iPhones, they cost 1600 rupees, so we're not talking big budget. I don't find my phone. But you know, it's just one of these lenses you can add on the phone. Same point here. So, what we've been thinking about in terms of, of digital imaging so far has been this the algorithmic term, William Ricchio, MIT. Yeah? The fact that you know suddenly all that information from real life becomes an algorithm, it gets virtualized. Photosynth. Photosynth is, is a software online where you can rebuild in 3D your photographs. You go and take pictures and this thing will calculate and read the images and build a dynamic 3D environment around you. This has been our conceptual framework. Yeah? Uh, Oculus Rift, these video game goggles, no? I mean, they, they cover all your view and you kind of move in the game and you interact with things, yeah. So, see the shift that I'm trying to point out here, that while we started out there with this kind of process of virtualization, creation of virtual reality, the virtual reproduction of the real, digital technologies are actually taking us in the opposite direction now. They are allowing us actually to engage with everyday life in its material. This is the kind of shift that you see happening also in the context of interactive documentaries, but that technologies like the uh, like these simple lenses or technologies like the like the GoPro are really making like quite evident for us. No? You can just wear that camera and you interact with your body in a way that was not possible before in a context of amateurial photography. 
So this is what I find interesting here is this passage also, you know, from the profession, this blurring of that boundary. A lot of interesting writing has happened on that, you know, people have got, I mean, of the dissolution, of the distinction. From here we just glide quite immediately into my last uh, bit, which, yeah, I'm having to quite well. You give me another 10 minutes and I'll be done. Um, into, you know, what do we mean by reality then, yeah? So you see, I mean, this is a, a standard example. This is a photograph, I mean, a Xerox copy of the photograph. I mean, it's Xerox copy of it's Xerox copy, Xerox copy of it's Xerox copy. Sorry, let me say photocopy just have to bring advertisement and money to Xerox every time you speak about it in English. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, so the more you proceed, the less information you have. Yeah? This is a very banal example. Yeah? Analog technologies actually allow you to, I mean, force you to, to, to lose information the more you copy. Yeah? This is my, uh, sorry, it shows that I love tennis. Now, all the examples have some of the events. Um, but you know, this is just, you know, screenshot and screenshot and screenshot. I mean, we know in the digital context, there is no copy. Yeah? There, the, the, the copy does not happen. You know, we have exact copies. So if we don't have a copy, how can we have the real thing? Yeah. Uh, this is the real question. I mean, if cop the copies have the sort, as in reality also the sort, how should we tackle it? That's one of the leading questions in all the debate regarding the digital form. Um, mention again. As we enter the post photographic era, we must face once again the ineradicable fragility of our ontological distinctions between the imaginary and the real, and the tragic elusiveness of the Cartesian dream. Fabulous phrase. Right? Now, how, how could we tackle this? I mean, how. Let me add you another couple of quotes. Uh, Suzanne Sontag's beautiful phrase, you know, that a fake painting falsifies the history of art, while a fake photograph falsifies reality. Yeah? You see, we've always been thinking that painting, you know, as. as um, oh, I don't have it here. Um, I have it later on, so I'll be back to that later on. But we've always given, like, photography this and moving images as well, this capacity to reproduce reality. The notion of visionism. That seeing is believing. Think about language. What you see is what you get in English, no? The idea of seeing is like an act of truth. You see something, it means that it's existing. Like, now how do we tackle with that in a context where the copies have become dominating trend? Yeah? Let us look at one example where this distinction, I mean, in my view, gets blurred. Um, HDR photography, high dynamic range photography. How many of you have played with it? Ever. None of you, yeah? Alright, wonderful. So, uh, this is a photograph, bad one, it's usual that I prefer the bad ones, uh, taken with my mobile phone, um, somewhere in Rome, which a, with HDR. And uh, if you look at Instagram, if you're consumers of Instagram, a lot of this stuff travels around. You see this kind of surreal, magic realism kind of atmosphere. Now, <coughs> Let me show you two examples. Yeah, this is a regular photograph that I take it with my mobile phone. This is a photograph that I persist through an application called Simply HDR. Okay, so um, what, what you, can, you can see something quite clearly. But if you look at the <coughs> bottom left corner, that's where you spot this out the most clearly. You see that white line there? Yeah, it's there and disappears. So suddenly, all the the the, 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 the contours are like very clear to you. What you couldn't see here with this blur now comes up. All along this post we have like a white line coming through, no? which is not visible in the original shot. Look at these uh, dead fishes in a fish shop. Yeah? Of course this simple HDR adds a bit of glow, you know, when you take out the white and you dissolve it, you know, you kind of push the white to noise in when you're photographing it against a living light, you know, without calibrating kind of the light on it. Uh, it also does a bit of maybe two tours to add the image, but the principle is quite simple. That's what I want to get. But this is not a photograph. You could reconstruct photography altogether. You know, this hasn't haven't photographs always lied anyway. You know, photographs are composed; they are filled in anyway. <coughs> but in this case, this is a maximized version. This is the technique behind HDR. You compose one photograph, you overlap these three photographs. 
So what happens is you take one picture calibrating on the lightest point. Yeah? In this case, it's it's calibrated here. Yeah? And so that we see, yeah, well that part without the digs are hole. You see, I mean the details you see here, you cannot see up there. Yeah? Alright, because this one is calibrated on the dark parts. So it's getting this part, the darker part, you don't see it here, you see it here. Yeah? So those are the two extreme calibrations, the darkest and the lightest part, and then the medium part. Yeah? Then the three images get overlapped one on top of the other. <coughs> the result is an image, image where everything is visible. Yeah? I couldn't see all of this with my eyes. No? I was probably focusing there, and I could see the light around that. But this kind of brings together a field of vision that the human eye cannot reproduce. Now, this of course, I've been showing it from the level of gimmick, but this is a photograph that won the, the World Press uh, Photo Award in 2013. Paul Hansen, Swedish journalist. Um, he took this photograph in Gaza during a funeral, and he was asked, to submit the, the original, yeah? because he, there's two ways of doing an HDR. One is of taking an HDR as a sequence of three photographs, that's what you generally do with your iPhone, you know? And then you know it incorporates movement as it does Yeah, You can see that there's movement. Huh? It's not just these overlap, but there's also movement, because of course I'm a human being and I, and I move even a triangle to detect probably that movement. That's one way. The other way is to simply work on the original use three originals in Photoshop and overlap to the each other. There's a mathematics behind this. Out of the, uh, the top awards in, in the World Press photo in the last five years, this colleague of mine has been doing research on this, uh, something like 80% are being produced by the two same post-production studios. One in England, one in, in America. So this is copyrighted photography. So the point being that they accuse them for actually lying. I said, because the original does not show. What you don't see there is the face of this guy, the face of the boy. You have like a light spread around here. This is what is visible in the original, clearly visible. And the rest fades in the background, it's dark, or it is too light. So what Paul Hansen did was to use HDR. And then there was a whole debate around it, there was a whole case, and he ended up winning. Yeah? So this photograph was kind of accepted, and since then HDR is blessed. Another photograph was from the uh, from Haiti, the earthquake in Haiti, no? uh, that one didn't go through. Yeah? So let us look further into HDR. What I find interesting about HDR is this. This is another HDR photograph. Right? You zoom in yeah? and you keep zooming in. Now what you see here, is it this thing? I mean look look at it, look at the water around the stone. Yeah? What impression does it give to you? I mean, adding this technology to it, it adds this, this surreal calculation of light that you and I have not use, and it adds time to it. Yeah? So suddenly, I mean, this, this is what I'm working on these days, uh, this to me is bringing it back into the realm of fame. I mean, do I need the real thing here to enjoy this photograph? I probably will know that this is not the real thing. I mean, can you see something like this in nature? I mean, if you can see like this, something like this in nature, you better go to a neurologist, probably. You know? um, so, this is of course something, but the question is that alongside with these practices comes also socialization in reading this kind of material. So, suddenly, the point that I'm trying to make here is that photography, do we need photography to relate to the document that it does trace of the real? Do we need that or are we looking for something else? Tilt shift. Yeah? Tilt shape photography. Another fantastic example. No? You know, you blur the top and the bottom so it all looks like a miniature. This, this, is, a, this is a real part. It's a real people but it looks like a miniature. No? Like a model train or something. Yeah? And these practices are becoming increasingly fundamental in our relation to photography. I look at it a lot with kids. Small kids are like uh, my nephew, 12 year old, my niece, 14 years old. They make videos and they, they use this, they do this. So, do we need the real thing to speak about photography or not? Yeah? My, my point here is that these practices actually force us to rethink that connection altogether, to rethink the idea of, of reality. <coughs> André Bazin, if you haven't read Bazin, we read Bazin's writings on, on photography, are 
simply a family um, Well, he suggested really that, that photography had liberated the painting from the responsibility of portraying the real, whether you live that bit or not, that's a different question. Yeah, he said that suddenly, you know, the obsession with likeness was put all into film and, and photography and removed from, from painting, so the painters could actually move quite freely from that. Photography and cinema, on the other hand, are discoveries that satisfy once and for all, and in, in its very essence, our obsession with realism. Yeah? But my point is that this was photography. And these practices, are they somehow closing the circle, bringing us back, yeah? straight into the connection between painting and photography? Let us look at the history of photography. Photography started up how? It was a bunch of portrait artists, you know, painters doing portraiture, who were running the risk of losing their jobs. They were the first ones to endorse photography. They were the first ones to buy cameras and to start using them. So they were using the camera instead of their painting skills to make their portraits. And when you look at the, 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 at the history of photography globally, but particularly in India, then this connection comes so evident to our eyes. Um, Adam Salomon, 1870, talking about 40 years, 30 years after the birth of the ship together, portrayed about that false sky. Look at the, uh, here there's two different connections. Eh? Look at the, the texture here of, of the road. Yeah? That, and look at his posture. This is a painting translated into a photo. Now, the first photographs were accused of being cheats, of being lies. This is a much, you know, um, socialization into, into aesthetics matters. Because uh, these photographers were accused of actually faking. Because they said, must be a painting. So people wouldn't buy them because they kind of suspected it. You know, black magic, this and this. So the first photographs sold as portraits uh, were retouched, you know, by human hand. For people to be able to relate to them. They had to contain painting within them so that people could relate to them. That's one part of the story. The other part is the way in which certain photographers started creating photographs looking like paintings so that people could relate to them. Um, stretch on to that. This is like uh, from, from the Arkansas World Collection. Yeah? Uh, it has an incredible history of painted photography. It, it really shows clearly you know, how in many parts of the world photography was born alongside the lounge and painting. It was not an independent stream altogether. The Delhi Darbar. Yeah? Delhi Darbar was portrayed in photographs, was portrayed in... Well, you know how these were made, no? These, each and every face is a photograph. Yeah? Then what you have is that you have a drawn background and drawn bodies. Then the faces from the photographs are glued on the correct sides on top of this drawing, then a photograph of the drawing is being made. That's your photograph. So this photograph contains painting, drawing, collage, and photography itself. It's all this kind of play of information. But what I find interesting, just to think about, look how many different strands of production uh, of representation it had. From photography itself, to pure painting, to drawings, into you know, newspaper information, and to these blends of these collages. We tend to forget that this is when, when I was in Greece, I just popped into an old lady's home. She just took me around, showing me. And this is what you find on her wall. Family portrait, but you find something strange. Heads are a bit like deviant from the bodies. It's been cut pasted. Yeah, it's all cut and pasted. So the bodies are not the photograph, it's a drawing. Yeah? So maybe they were not even there altogether. Some of these portraits actually portray together people who died at a distance of 10 to 20 years from each other. So you see what the point that I'm trying to play with here, I mean, do we really need here? I mean, the, the average of the photo, of our understanding of photography is reality, something that is a historical construct, yeah? We haven't needed it throughout. I mean, this photograph is very much enjoyable, and for this lady, it is. She told me all the story, and this was my, that was her mother, and so on and so forth. But it didn't really need to incorporate a direct connection to the real. Opposite wall, this is her, a bit young, younger. So this is another strand of that, you know, black and white photographs made in color, painted in color. Yeah? And I like the way it hangs underneath the painting, you know. So in this passage between these two walls, there's quite a bit of 
the history of the blurring of the distinction of authority. You see the point that I'm trying to get at? It's like we've been kind of hardening that distinction. <coughs> go back to where I started with dialogues, you know, the distinction between media units, you know, photography vis-a-vis -vis moving images, or here photography vis-a-vis -vis painting. It's a historical construct that belongs to modernity, you know? but it does not really, so, and this is where I, I, I want to kind of to end my point, is that there's two ways of tackling this. One is the revolution model, yeah? So digital images are causing a revolution, creating something totally new. Uh, my approach is slightly different. I mean, they are forcing us to read up and rethink the conventions and assumptions that in the meantime have materialized in our approach to images. And see, the point that I'm making here, HDR, is actually a much truer form of photography. If we look at how photography was born, yeah? especially in relation to portraiture, landscaping. I mean, look at the collections of material from India. I mean, the, the, the colonial administrators went, went very quickly from like the aquarelle to the photograph. It's like a continuum passing from one to the other. That's an area that I'm not particularly knowledgeable about, but I'm sure that I find quite some interesting material. So you see, when I look back at this, I see two things. One is really the need to integrate approaches here. Yeah? So I don't think you can deal with images without dealing with material culture and digital culture at the same time. Nor in the absence of a good sense of contextuality. That's what I see as apologies to solitude coming in as a good contamination yeah? in the field of visual culture. Uh, so that, that's kind of an academic disciplinary agenda that I have. But then I'm more interested in leaving to you, you know, as a kind of a, a thought producer <coughs> is that if you look through whatever I've been discussing now in terms of supposedly novelty, of course again I don't tackle this novelty, but you go back into literature, <coughs> the point of media distinction, you find it in our service was discussing this song. You don't really need idols. You find it in the manage in the conversions, early 90s, by all means, but on the list it's there. Roland Barthes and Foucault, the writings on authorship, yeah? On, on the death of the author is what? Is the fact that a book is actually written by the reader. No, it's that dialectic. It's not. That's what helps you understand the functioning of an idol. Uh, arts history and performance theory come in there. Digital images are objects always in the making. The question of materiality in action counts. Christopher Pinney's work on, on uh, Indian uh, popular photography. Elizabeth Edwards' work on uh, Aboriginal. Uh, Australians and their engagement with. Uh, if you're interested in that topic, there's a, an article I've suggested it to some of you. Um, it's called Sound and you know, Photographs of the Sound of History. Elizabeth Edwards so discusses how among the Aboriginal Australians, photographs are, are items make make people talk. They are shared, so they are objects, and no one cares about what's really represented in the image. It's the photograph is such. What, it's materiality, it smells, so it makes people talk, and cry, and sing, so on and so forth. Phenomenology and neurosciences come into that. Yeah. Integrated vision. The latest discoveries now in neuroscience are the fact that, you know, our brain is not controlling our vision, but you know, our, our entire nervous system does that. So our entire body is in a way connected to our visual function. Uh, there's this kind of, well, I'm, I'm trying, I mean, this is not my field, but I'm trying to understand this thing to the better neurons. A lot of research happening there. So, anyway, just to show you know, the complexity of the field. And the question of HDR, you know, have you one of parts? Walter Benjamin's writings on uh, photography and magic is one of the perils of the history of photography. Bazin, the history of photography at large. Um, so, basically, we don't need to look at it as novelty, but we actually, I think, need to take these practices as good indications to actually look back more critically at how we constructed our understanding of oh, the I finished time for discussion if I left it. Do you have any thoughts? Who are the viewers? So I rushed a bit at the end to keep time, which I think I managed to do. Question. This thing about falsifying reality to the moment you take a photograph and but then, you know, you're always questioning what is reality anyway, this the rhetorical question, what is reality? <laughs> because... Do you mean that I have this anyway? 
Yeah, like what she is seeing is not what I am seeing. And then if I take a photograph of it, I think, oh, it's so real. And then the lighting is different from what I am really seeing. Yeah, just a thought. Yeah, let me think. I think there is perhaps one image that I am working on, which kind of speaks of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, But you can see it now. Yeah. So do you have you seen this photograph? Mm -hmm. And if yes, in what context? This so I've seen in the Delhi Oralities Project in the collection. In which project? The Centre for Community Knowledge. They're doing Delhi Oralities Project, so they have right. a collection. Which is also has a collection. Delhi. Which is also has a collection. Yeah, that's from Delhi. It's been recently used in the framework of our performance by Lux yes. Media Collective yes. and Sulaik yes. Um So this, uh, anyway, the story behind, I mean, the, the first time, okay, when you see this photograph, <coughs> of course, I mean, this, I'm just throwing out my... Uh, which one is that? The last one. Um, you can immediately sense that this is a very composed image, isn't it? I mean, we've been discussing it, you know, with Zuleik and uh, as, as, as theatre. You know, is this a photograph or is it... You can see it's composed, but at the same time, it's a photograph which documents cruelty, no? Mm -hmm. And I've always seen it as, you know, this is a good kind of uh, window into the debate on the so-called by British power mutiny, yeah? But this photograph was taken actually for the opposite purpose of how we think of it, no? Because it was actually taken The photographer is, a, is a, an Italian half English guy called Felice Beato, he's one of the first war photographers, and one of the first people to experiment with uh, panoramic photography as well. Very interesting work is done. So, what he did was actually to go to Sikandar by three months, I think, four months, six months, quite some time after the, the killing of 2300 Sikhos, so called Vietnamese by the British, and actually get the servants to dig them out. Distribute them perfectly in this space, place the servants, and they take the picture. Yeah? So, this, I mean, I'm thinking of it in relation to your question. I mean, I think this is a fabulous photograph to use in order to raise the question whether, you know, this is an eye, right? isn't it? But at the same time, it is a document. But it's a document of something different than what was meant by the photographer, isn't it? That's something that you were kind of aiming at. Yeah. <coughs> Well, in fact, this is such a nasty event, mm. and uh, I don't know if it's sort of bringing the old way. Uh, the kind of interest one has in representation is always the possibility of reflection in it. Reflection as a reflective. Sure. Um, whereas in, in, the, in the presentation, if you wait to get any kind of mixing two points and not segregating them, which I think is like one is the apparent uh, outburst of technology and how it's allowing us to take pictures and visual and material and whatever in different ways but it's also like you know it's also uh, capitalistic in its own sure. sense so it, it, I don't know if it's really allowing us that conscious reflection But it's more like to flood you and distract you and you know um, legitimize that distraction in a different sense. You know, so it's like it's like it promises you a lot you can do, but what you can do is something. You know, by the time you uh, kind of evolve within, like it took hundred years for cinema to reach to a stage where it is, and once it's still not sure if cinema is reached its any pinnacle point. What I'm trying to say is, by the time you kind of struggle with it, find out its possibilities, it's outdated. You know? It's like it's not there. Come do something else. You know? And there is so much fascination with what it creates. You know, HDR as something so beautiful. You know, one has been uh, seeing that a lot online. 
and it tends to kill the possibility of detection. Because, you know, using representation as a possibility of reflecting on what we do. But why does it kill it? I mean, it kills it in so far as you take for granted. And yes, we have this conversation here, right? Uh, it kills it in so far as you take for granted that representation is a process that deals with the distinction between reality and and it's representation. I mean, that's what the process of representation is. Yeah. So here, I'm, yeah, I could agree with what you say, but I still think that that's exactly the crux. I mean, what I'm trying to do is to make visible assumptions that are there that we may not be thinking about. So we take, I mean, it's a matter of fact that we take the images in this way, and they, they travel, they are there. You know, I mean, I take them as social facts, you know, to use that. And they are out there, so how should we look at them? So by lifting it up, I think that they deal with this kind of re-inscribing of that relationship. Now where the crux of the matter is, is the politics of that. That's an entirely different chapter. But once again, I'm not in any possible way praising this as far too beautiful, you know? But I'm just seeing the inevitability of rethink our assumptions regarding images because of their existence. I may like it, this life with the green is a green that has nothing to do. But of course this is an any factor. This is making me really think, you know. But, and I think you know that this is a lot of the stuff that we are doing is that now the politics of that are exactly those that we want to mean, What's the ethics behind this? You know? I mean this uh, shared imaging has of course this, this capacity to create a bunch of material which is out there and who owns it, who can use it. The rumor that you cannot cancel yourself from Facebook, you cannot cancel your data from Facebook. How do we deal with that? iCloud was hacked, what was it, one month back or something. So, of course, that's a reality. That to me, though, is, is uh, that would require another similar amount of time to discuss that aspect. But it's sort of relevant. But once again, the question that this somehow intervenes upon a perception of the distinction between reality and its representation, I think it's there. But in a different way than we thought of. Because it's not, I mean, these kind of bodily connections are not the link they in that connection, but they actually highlight that that's the way which I think, which I'm not, I don't mean in the normative sense, yeah? but they're surely bringing us back to that. You see, when, when Flickr was born, I mean, the passage was born from Kodak's archive into Flickr, yeah? web 1.2 to web 2.0, that's the biggest difference. We substituted the, the, the library in the computer, no, so we go to, to Media or something, we call like archive, and we look at other people's images. With Flickr, we start, start, suddenly to upload our own images. Yeah? So there's been two usages happening. You know? Before, the fear was that we end up knowing everything about what people do in Japan and nothing about their neighbors. <clears throat> now we're complaining with Flickr and Facebook that we know too much about neighbor and too little about what happens far away because we're actually, you know, this is the, the, uh, the Instagram mark, you know, food photographs and all that stuff. There is a shift. Which what is how we shall we what, what I'm saying, no, I'm not like counting anything what yeah, you're saying. I'm only deriving. No, but with that. No, no, no. I mean, what I'm saying is I'm only deriving what you're saying is that the fact when somebody says I know too much of my neighbor to visit the paper, yeah. what I'm saying is because of this bombardment of uh, sure. visuals and it's in its bizarre form without any logic. You, know, you just place a camera and you yeah. 